years. Our topic uh, today is the path to an integrated network operating center. I'm Jesse Burst of Smart Grid News. I'm your moderator. And we're currently speaking with Vaibhav Parmar of Accenture. And here's a question from Kevin who asks, where does a typical NOC reside? Is it standalone? Is it uh, typically integrated with an engineering group? Yeah, Jesse, that's a great question. And, and when we hear from Karen, we'll get the perspective from, from Pepco Holdings. We're starting to see that a variety of trends. One is that this INOC, to the extent that the utility is able to get to a level of advanced maturity, does become a new standalone organization and or entity. There is now a desire to co-locate it with the uh, kind of the engineering operations or the, the power operations side of the house. There are a variety of rationale for that, but uh, that's the trend that we're seeing. Okay, terrific. And Karen, if you're on the line, I might ask, did you give a lot of thought to where you would house it, and where did it end up? Yeah, we did give that a great deal of thought, and ultimately decided to co-locate it with our system operations organization, which is managing the real-time operations of the transmission and distribution system. And I can talk a little more about that in my comments. Great, terrific. So, Vaibhav, um, what elements, you, you know, you've shown a couple of slides that uh, get at the complexity of these communication systems and uh, the various processes and services. What elements are utilities most eager, typically, to, to integrate? What are the biggest points of pain that they want to, to integrate into the stock? So, uh, Jesse, we've seen a, a variety of trigger points or, you know, priority interest areas. and, and the, the variety is driven by a number of things. The geography that the utility operates in and the regulatory construct that they operate in, as well as what's already underway. And so what I mean by that is primarily in, in the U.S. and in Canada and in North America, we're seeing that uh, smart metering or advanced metering initiatives are the trigger point into thinking about the INOC. There are a couple of other geographies outside of North America where we are seeing other trends, and by that I mean it's things like sharing of, let's say, fiber assets between the transmission environment and the corporate enterprise environment, or it's the initial deployment of some type of distribution automation technologies where both kind of the OT and the IT side of the house are, are using a common set of physical assets and virtual assets. So what we see the trigger point being one of those. I think smart metering in the in the U.S. market has been a you know big trigger, and and as the volume of meters that are deployed gets to a large scale, uh, and the dependency of the technologies on enabling those business processes, whether it's meter to cash, or theft analytics, or whatever it might be, becomes a you know critical business activity. The need to have this visibility across the end-to-end -end chain of systems and devices is quite important, and, and that's what's been the trigger point in, in um, you know, in some of these instances. Vaibhav, Joe asks if there uh, is a still a logical demarcation between IT and OT. So is the INOC typically also responsible for programming slash configuring slash responding to OT devices, uh, reclosers, cap bank controllers, et cetera? Yeah, and, and this is where um, I think there's still you know, a lot of dialogue and discussion going. I think where we are today, or what we're starting to see as a near-term trend, is the INOC will be the place where these reclosers or, or TND type devices will get configured, but from a communications and computing point of view, not necessarily from a, you know, this is how it's going to move power point of view. And I know that's a little bit of a gray area, that's a little bit of a, a debatable area, but that's at least the initial view that we're seeing. And certainly, you know, Karen, if you'd like to comment uh, from a PEPCO perspective, that'd be great. Yeah, thanks. The reason that we purposely decided to place the INOC in our system operations group is because we see the uh, future migration of and need for some kind of centralized monitoring that crosses the ITOT boundary. And one of the things that we've done initially in our INOC and for the foreseeable future is uh, set it up so that it's a central monitoring location. And so the historical device owners, whether they're IT or OT, would remain. 
were just going to do the monitoring, controlling, and sort of the first response operations from, from the NOC itself. I think it's sort of critical to our strategy or our long-term vision to see that this convergence of technology is going to start affecting the electric system operations in the same way that system operations was conceived of to monitor and provide first response to electric system devices without owning the devices or configuring them or maintaining them. We see that the same future for the NOC itself. Terrific. Thank you, Karen. Uh, still other questions, and we will pause a couple more times and again at the end to, to answer more questions. But why don't we move ahead for the time being, Dave, Bob? Sure. Thank you, Jesse. So a couple of uh, things that I wanted to bring up in, in this next set of slides, the first being, you know, what are the challenges in deploying an INOC, and, and certainly what are the challenges that the INOC is addressing? So again, our key perspective here is that as we get more and more sophisticated in these T&D systems and T&D environments and we're starting to look at the service as a holistic business capability, if we're not able to manage at the service level, we will run into issues when problems arise and, and certainly in being able to assess the impact of the problem and being able to find out what the root cause of the problem is. And again, some real life examples that we've seen there's a break in the meter to cash process. The business has an expectation of the bill being sent out at specific intervals. If there are error rates in that bill generation or if the bills are not being sent out at the expected intervals, how do you figure out what the root cause of the problem is? And, and we've seen it where there has been a scramble. You know, the, the, and myself coming from the telecom world, you always blame the network first, whether it's a, a true issue or not. And more often than not, it's not a network issue. So what can you put in place to, to be able to quickly identify the root cause of the problem? And, and that's what we're trying to get to with the INOC. You know, certainly the, the, the things that it, it helps with are around efficiency. So not only reducing the number of alarms or events that need to be managed, but being able to quickly identify what the root cause of the problem is. We get to performance management. And again, this is now more important as we have SLAs as a business has expectations on how quickly activities need to take place, whether it's the generation of a bill or it's how quickly data needs to get to a recloser or a distribution automation scenario. How do we manage these complexities and the complex set of interconnected devices that are out there? Compliance, I mean, I, I can go into this uh, you know, all day long in terms of how can this INOC help from a compliance point of view, the amount of data that's gathered the amount of data that's logged can help in a variety of compliance scenarios. And again, at the end of the day, it's all about service levels. It's all about managing at the service level and delivering on the service level expectations. So the next couple of slides, I wanted to focus on what is this INOC? I mean, you know, we've talked about the benefits, why it's needed. Uh, I wanted to paint kind of a visual view for you on what makes up an INOC? And, and again, there are a lot of variety of definitions of this, and, and the, the actual implementation of an INOC can take many different paths. But you know, at, the, at the most elementary level, what we say the INOC consists of are a new set of processes or a set of processes that may exist already but now have been integrated across a variety of different organizations. And what I mean by that is, uh, IT operations, telecom operations, grid operations, meter operations, even customer care operations and contact center operations, all of these have an integrated view. All of these now have greater handoff points from one to the other, and there are better expectations of KPIs and SLAs across these end-to-end -end processes. It's also made up of an organization. Uh, again, whether this organization is physically a new organization or it's somewhat of a, a virtual uh, logical organization, there is now some level of a, a named entity that constitutes this INOC. And then lastly, the technology. The technology piece is interesting because in the IT world, and certainly in, in data center and telecom operations, we've seen a lot of sophistication in the use of technology for things like fault management and performance management. And now what we're starting to see is that those same set of systems can actually play a role in bridging that IT and OT gap 
and certainly the way we manage, let's say, a router on the in the data center side is the same way we'll start to think about managing not only a router in a substation, but certainly a an IP addressable device like a recloser or a relay or whatever it might be. When you put all of this together, you know, what does this look like? And and taking the, the network chart that I had shown a little while ago and working here on this slide from bottom to top, you can start to see again that that we can segment our utility business environment into a couple of key elements and today we manage these elements through its own singular operations environments. What we start to see with the INOC is the power delivery world or the power engineering world which has had grid operations capabilities for a long time. Communications networks which have had telecom operations, you know, IT infrastructure with IT operations and the metering world with meter operations all of these operational environments now become more integrated at the people, process, and technology layer. And again, there are levels of maturities that you can, you can envision here. One end state view could be that this is now all a physically new entity with uh, a new set of people looking at the entire stack from left to right. Or you can think about a, a series of steps where in the initial view, this is really a, uh, a people or process oriented perspective and the technology may come in uh, later on. From a solution components perspective, uh, there are a couple of things that you know, we wanted to focus on, uh, specifically on the process and the technology layer. Within the INOC, you know, the technologies that we talk about are, are technologies that we've been used to seeing in the IT and the telecom world for a very long time. Uh, for those who may be familiar with with ETOM uh, and the FCAPS model, really that's what we're talking about, the, the basic systems that make up fault configuration, performance, and security management. But those are the types of technological systems that constitute the, the INOC. You know, we can elaborate on that a little bit more and, and think about things like inventory management, uh, inventory management being a little different than asset management, which we're used to in the utility world. Inventory management is where we actually get to a graphical topology view of these interconnected devices. You know, what are the network routes between them? What is the IT-centric configuration associated with each of those devices? So that's the technological solution component view. If we talk about the process perspective, we can apply FCAPS processes but I think what we're starting to see more and more of is actually applying ITIL processes into managing this new kind of T&D world. So now we're starting to bridge FCAPs with ITIL and applying those to environments and devices that traditionally were not in scope. Uh, so it, it's a very interesting and innovative time because you know, we, we haven't seen this happen in, in other industries to a scale like this just yet. For those who are on this webinar that, that kind of have a, an engineering or a, an architecture role or perspective, you know, I wanted to show this slide up here just to say again, as you visualize what this INOC looks like, you, you can imagine potentially a, you know, a big room with lots of monitors, lots of chairs and, and eyes on the screen and lots of red, orange and green flashing up on the screen. But what does it look like behind the scenes? What are those, those systems that actually make up this INOC? And here's one example view of it, that this, you know, not to imply that this is how it should be, but you can start to see that from the top and, and working downwards, we've got like a manager of managers perspective, right? This is a system or the tool that really has that holistic view of the service. This is where we model the different types of service layers, the topology layers, Supporting the manager of managers is your full network management suite of products, spanning the entire range from incident to security to configuration to impact analysis, performance management, and systems and fault management. Those who come from the IT and the telecom world, you'll say, well, we've already got these tools in place today, and, and that's actually a very valid point. What we're starting to show or say here is that these tools have historically been used for only a specific set of elements on the on the bottom part of this chart. You know, typically you may have been managing your data center and your IP or MPLS type environments, your microwave environments. Uh, what we're starting to say now is this type of a view can be used to manage 
the new set of devices that are kind of on the bottom left of this chart, your, your metering environment, your substation environment, your feeder line environment, you know, to the extent that we want to take this into the generation world, e even some of your plant generation systems, right? This, this is what's new and this is what's not typically been included in scope of the INOC. So I wanted to conclude by, you know, reiterating what are the benefits? Why INOC? You know, what, what, is, this, uh, what is this thing and, and why is it so important? We talked a lot about, you know, the trigger points that lead to the INOC. Um, certainly the variety and sophistication of, of new devices and the associated communications networks that go with it. The need to have visibility at the service layer and not just at the individual device or, or domain layer. What all that means is we, we've got a variety of technical benefits that, that are associated with the INOC, right? Being able to address all of these devices, you know, from, from the IT terminology, we can ping them and see what's going on. We can get more deterministic on the behavior of these devices when it comes to communications and computing capabilities. We can figure out, you know, what the root cause of a problem is a lot faster, and more importantly, we can get to remediation a lot faster because we can model these and, and use those signatures for, for repeated management. From a business point of view, again, right, when, when we can commit to the SLAs that the business expects and we can even deliver on new SLAs that the business has not been used to, I think there's certainly a lot of byproduct benefit. We can help with compliance requirements. We can help with the, you know, ultimately, with the SADI and the, the SAFI and the KD indexes, right, because all of those are now going to be dependent on these new sophisticated technologies. Now, I could keep going, but I think at this point, Jesse, I'm going to turn it back to you for a uh, next set of questions. Thanks. And we've been listening to Vaibhav Parmar, who's the global lead for wireless network consulting at Accenture. So John asks if you're seeing uh, evidence of this uh, INOC phenomenon outside North America. Yes, absolutely. The needs of the utilities outside of North America are not materially any different. The regulatory landscape might be different. I think if we look at, let's say, Europe, you know, the UK landscape with how deregulated they are is quite interesting. Parts of Central Europe still have, you know, different landscapes of how utilities are integrated or, you know, deregulated. But certainly for the utility that's got the business of delivering power, this is quite a, a universal theme. You know, we're speaking with our clients in China about this right now. We're, we're actually engaged in some activities in Southeast Asia and in the Australia market on the same topic. So absolutely, this is a, a global theme. Julio asks, and maybe Karen can chime in if she can find a politically acceptable way to answer, but he asks if there's often internal resistance from the OT side to integrating this communications management. Well, I actually was going to spend some time talking about this, and you're right, it can be a very politically charged conversation internally. I would say both the IT and the OT side had some very interesting objections to it, and those were among the most uh, difficult challenges that we encountered. And I'll well, spend some wait. time talking about it. Yeah, let's do that then. And maybe Bob, Jose asks about our suppliers of EMS, DMS, OMS, et cetera, are they targeting this INOC concept? The short answer is no. We're starting to see some of those vendors, particularly on the, the DMS and the OMS side, become interested in this data that an INOC can provide to enrich the OMS or the DMS experience, but they are not taking any position in saying our DMS software will be able to provide this holistic service-centric view of the technologies. And, and I think our view on that is it's primarily because you can see from one of those previous charts how diverse of a set of devices and networks and, and computing technologies that exist out there. And I think it would be pretty difficult for some of these grid operation systems vendors to be able to try to do what others in the industry have done you know, previously and, and have gotten maturity on it. 